I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, I am talking to Professor Richard Allen Schof. He is an English literature professor with a specialty in medieval literature, from Dante to Chaucer to Milton and beyond. Recently, he has compiled a magnificent work. It is a book of poetry that he has composed himself. It is called Selected Poems from 1968 to 2021. And we are delighted to have Richard join us here today on Spotlight. And we'd like to thank the folks at Good River Print and Media for helping us put Richard in the spotlight today. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And I go by my middle name, Al. Okay, then I will call you Al. That sounds <laughs> like a... Uh, Paul Simon, yeah, Paul, song. you can call me Yeah, Al. Paul Simon won't mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Al, sounds good. This book is kind of like your life in poetry, spanning from yes. 1968 to 2021, I would think. Yes, uh, the um, decades that it covers um, represent um, almost all the uh, writing practice that uh, I've undertaken uh, they're not all the poems that I've written, but they do represent how I've practiced and how I've tried to mature. Um, they include um, some very uh, open and accessible poems, and they include some very intellectual poems, and they also represent uh, my specialty in medieval studies, Anglo-Saxon uh, especially. And I try to uh, bring my reader into the the world that I have um, lived in for over 50 years now um, as a writer, uh, not only of scholarship, but also of poetry. It's one thing to collect a journal over the years, and I think that's a wonderful thing to have. But to have documented your life with your creations I think is even more special. I think the fact that, you know, what was going on in 1968 is just phenomenal. Uh, and you can look back at how that influenced your life, influenced your work, all the way up to 2020, when we were all locked down during the pandemic, you were writing poems as well. So how has your work changed over the years? Has it reflected the times, like I presume? Uh, it certainly has. Um, it's become um, less private uh, and less uh, adolescent, um, as almost all poetry, poems uh, young people write have a tinge of adolescence. It's become much more public. Uh, I have a section of, of the 10 sections in the book. One is entitled Politics, and it includes a number of poems I've written about uh, the political condition of America. Another section is called science, because I have a very uh, long-standing interest in physics, and uh, in particular in medicine, uh, though I'm not trained in medicine. So I write poems about uh, the discoveries of physics in the past 20 to 30 years, which simply fascinate me. And there are sections devoted to painting, uh, classical painting and more recent painting. Um, there's a section devoted to animals where I write poems about my corgis. We're on our third corgi. Uh, the first two have passed on, but they gave us great joy. And I like writing about them. Um, my daughter, Elaine, is a very good painter. Um, and um, he lives here in North Florida and produces beautiful work. I write some poems about her and her work. Um, the changes that they reflect are very much part of the time, yes, as you've said, but I try throughout to stay focused on what I, I think might be most interesting to others and not just to me. What was it like choosing 300 out of the thousands of poems you have written over the years? Did you always have a, a pile of poems that you said, these are my favorite and I'm keeping them here? Or did you have to go through volumes to find them? Tell me a little bit about that process. Well, the process 
is is fascinating. But the first thing to say is that, like everything else in our current lives, the computer revolutionized it. Um, before the computer, I had typewritten drafts in boxes and boxes, uh, along with rejection slips in the same boxes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with the computer, uh, archiving work is now much simpler, much faster. And um, if I pay attention, which I try to do, much more accurate, so that I could go through the entire uh, files, which are well in excess of two and a half megabytes uh, of uh, written data and read and think about what I was reading as I tried to, to uh, select poems. Um, and I had this idea, which I've already mentioned to you of uh, having the, the book opens with actually a list of 10 categories that uh, the reader can run an eye over and make a decision about where he or she wants to start. Mm -hmm. And each one of those categories represents something very, very important to me, but also, I think, important to others who uh, would want to be reading poetry. And thus, I uh, was able to organize the collection uh, out of the mass of material and give it a, uh, a certain coherence. They're not a, a kind of narrative as such, but they do have coherence across uh, common themes uh, and uh, ideas about how I use language. Um, and I am one of those poets who is committed to understanding poetry as the the enlightened and illuminated use of language, not necessarily rhymes or strict prosodies or uh, ideologies, but uh, a celebration of language's capacities to show us more than we uh, initially appreciate. Um, and this is where the training I've had in academia has really come in handy because uh, I have studied languages, uh, quote, dead languages. Mm -hmm. They're not dead to me. <laughs> uh, and um, from them, I have learned sort of like a, a very distant uh, shadow of Tolkien, uh, whom I cannot compete with. But I have learned, as did he, that you can gather a great deal from the history of words. Uh, you learn that words have an origin, uh, and um, some things come to you that simply are simply striking, sir. Um, mm -hmm. A good example, quick one, is um, the story of the uh, Iliad, where Paris has to choose amongst the three goddesses and uh, he fails in one way because Ares, E-R-I-S, a, a goddess who was not invited with the other goddesses, throws the apple in the midst of them, and then suddenly there's this great fight, right? Uh, Ares, which means discord and strife in Greek, is related to the same root as produces Eros, or love, in particular sexual love, but not exclusively sexual love. Ares and Eros uh, both come from a, an ancient root that means to split apart, to divide, to create discord, which is exactly what the goddess does uh, in the story of the Iliad. When, when I learn things like that, um, my imagination is just supercharged mm -hmm. it it releases me to to think and imagine about things that i otherwise would never be able to access um a a similar uh experience that readers uh don't have to be necessarily trained to to appreciate 
is uh, the um, uh, use in Old English, uh, the progenitor of our uh, modern English, of the word rude, mm -hmm. R-O-O-D, for the cross, uh, the crucifixion. Uh, and the Dream of the Rude is a famous poem, The Dream of the Cross, that comes down to us from Anglo-Saxon um, and has been uh, extensively studied. I just took that idea and wrote a poem called The Dream of the Road, mm -hmm. R-O-A-D, and I, I folded the Anglo-Saxon uh, imagery into the modern imagery and produced a short poem that uh, talks about striving for a better understanding or a, a higher life, if you will. Um, if I may, I'll read mm -hmm. that poem. I would love to hear it. Uh, because it's not long, as I say. Um, and um, I forgot where I put it here. Uh, there it is. Okay. The Dream of the Road. Recurring for as long as I remember, the dream never varies in its story. I'm traveling somewhere. I never arrive. The terrain differs on every journey, and I never know where I am at the start, though I feel it is a place I must escape. Danger threatens in every direction, and on all sides, strangers stare at me. I never know how I happen to be there. Sometimes I drive a motorcycle, sometimes a car, sometimes a truck, a bike never too slow, too exposed, too precise. I go as fast as the vehicle will over tarmac, dirt, Clover leaves or rocks, always afraid that the machine will stall, unsure when I turn if it will follow, suspicious some beast will suddenly break free and drag me to a land of no return. But before the beast, a precipice looms, and I have to decide to wake up or die on a road that will someday end in a dream beautiful beautiful thank you it's... what i do here the reason i wanted to, uh i talked with your colleagues about reading this one aloud that i believe here i i've really gotten close to what it is as an artist i want to do mm -hmm. bringing the past and the present together in a simple language there are no technical terms here. There are no big uh, jawbreakers. Right. Uh, and at very simple cadence, uh, mm -hmm. it's basically a, a decasyllabic cadence, standard English. As Frost said, there are two meters in English, loose pentameter and strict pentameter. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one is probably loose pentameter. But I think th the audience can hear the uh, way that the movement of the lines reflects the movement within the dream of traveling to an unknown destination, which is uh, very much a part of the old English poem where the cross is the unknown destination. Um, so I wanted to, in particular, to share this one uh, because it, it does many of the things that I very much want to do. Well, I'm glad you did. What year did you write that poem? I'm just curious. Uh, that'll be three years ago, 2019, uh, just before the uh, onset of COVID. Um, and then I, as COVID hit and quarantined us, uh, locked us in, in mm -hmm. the house, I began revising some of the work that I had, I, I did uh, in the previous uh, three or four years before my retirement. Um, and I used the, the COVID shutdown to do a lot of revision. Uh, and 
the work is better for it. Hmm. Absolutely. I think we've had BC and AD. I think we're going to have BC before COVID and AC <laughs> after COVID going forward because it really is a line of demarcation. Yes. Let me put on my scholar hat for a moment and take a sure. look at the poem you just read. I was educated by Jesuits and I studied Keats and you know uh, Chaucer and all that as well. So let me see how my analysis of your poem is or my interpretation is, and you can correct me. So the road is the metaphor of life? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the beast. Uh, I was trying to, uh, is that the burdens of life? Uh, death that we're facing? The um, Within the dream, they can be visualized as actual monsters, hmm. but they can also be felt as burdens, debts uh things that I've failed to do or wish I had done. Uh, and as they rise up, they become part of what I I think I must flee, but at the same time I know I can't really leave behind. They're part of me. And that's what makes it really difficult for any of us to deal with the past. You can't just cut it off. What is it Faulkner once said? Uh the past is not past. It's, in fact, always present. Hmm. Yeah, I love that saying by Faulkner. You know, it kind of gives us a feeling of, of hope that it's, everything is eternal. And uh, it's beautiful. Let me ask you about the vehicles you chose to write about in your poem. You talked about a motorcycle. You talked about a car, I believe, bicycles. Are those the different stages of life? Is that why you chose to have different modes of transportation? Um, partly, yes. I, I would be uh, very interested in pursuing that tack with them more uh, directly in the, in the composition. They um, are ironic apropos the dream of the rude, the old English poem, the dream of the cross, because then there would have been the occasional ox or mule and two feet, two-legged creatures. Mm. Um, and what I'm trying to do is set up that, um, ultimately it's a balance, but it's also a counterbalance between a much older time and our more modern time. Absolutely. The dream at the end, you view life as sort of like a dream that's continued into death that is another dream? I, I propose that as a way of concluding the poem, because I think that that is very much in uh, uh, consonance with what the old English uh, anonymous writer, we don't know who wrote The Dream of the Root, mm. uh, to, like so much old English poetry, it is anonymous. But I think it's very much uh, consistent with uh, the way he looked at the dream of, for, the, for him, the Savior climbing the cross. Um, and that comes over for us, whether or not we're religious, because like him and uh, everyone we've ever heard about on earth we all die hmm. and um there was this fellow in england who taught us uh we are such stuff as dreams are made on <laughs> uh, and our little life is rounded with a sleep hmm. uh, these are connections that are the kind of thing that i try to do in poetry um i i am uh, an intellectual writer. I think, uh, more importantly, I, I would call myself a mindful writer because I do attempt uh, sensuous mindfulness in my writing. But above all, I try to connect the traditions that I inherit. I was raised uh, in the Old South, uh, Protestant, uh, primarily in my earliest years uh, on Shakespeare, Milton, and King James's Bible, um, those uh, traditions 
are still part of who I am. Uh, I'm not a particularly observant religious, mm -hmm. but I, I, I affirm those traditions as part of me and of what I write. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful how you've melded the styles and the symbolism of the past with the present into your own work. And it's very effective. And just the fact that we can talk about your poem probably for an hour or more um, and now, analyze it is the beauty of poetry because yes, it it's not direct. It's not, you know, explicit. It's, it's, to be interpreted yes. and will mean different things to different people. And yes. that's the beauty of poetry, don't you think? I certainly do think that. I think that the, the more we become familiar with the way implication comes out of poetry, uh, and implication is different for every reader. Every reader infers his or her own implications out of a poem. But when, as you just said a moment ago, we sit down and, and try to talk about them, we can arrive at um, a, a conversation of, um, a, how should one say, intellectual togetherness. It doesn't have to be, it's not in any way uh, like the old style notion of encounter groups or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's like coming into a shared discourse where uh, different as we are, we can understand things that are that we're saying to each other. It's funny, you talked about politics before and when I was preparing for the interview with you today, I thought about politics as well. And I thought about politics used to be almost like poetry. If you think about how some of our early leaders spoke, uh, the most articulate modern leader was John F. Kennedy, who's often associated with Robert Frost. Um, what's wrong with our culture today that there is too much prose and not enough poetry? I'm reminded, excellent question. I'm reminded uh, of a, a saying, um, I can't now immediately recall where I first heard it. Some modern politician uh, observed that we we campaign in poetry, mm -hmm. we govern in prose. Yes. Um, because governing is very difficult and it takes a lot of prosaic communication. What I feel most deeply regarding the question you just asked is that um, we have demonized rhetoric and rhetoric in our world here in, in America, I, I think also in Europe um, and elsewhere, rhetoric has become a dirty word. It is a word that um, is uh, almost always negative in political contexts. Whereas, as you well know, because of the way you were trained, you go back not very far and most public servants were trained in rhetoric. Mm. They were trained to speak a coherent and a fluent and, if possible, a gracious language so that they could communicate to the people that they served. Um, and we've lost that. And I, I don't have any, I mean, I'm almost 75 years old. Uh, and I, I don't have any solutions, uh, but I do feel that when I hear the word rhetoric in modern political contexts, it's almost always demonized and not really understood. Um, there are moments when a modern politician will rise to the occasion um, with words that are in the best sense rhetorical. Uh, you mentioned Kennedy, I agree. Might also mention the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. uh, who very much was trained in a rhetorical tradition. Um, 
as in fact I was, uh, the the tail end of it back in the 40s and 50s. Um, and it's it's gone now. I don't think it could be it could be brought back. I could be wrong, but I I, I don't think so. But to your question, which is a, a very important question, I think by demonizing rhetoric, we lose something of civilized discourse. And we know from recent years how uncivilized discourse can become. Alas. Absolutely. In fact, I don't want to turn this into a Trump conversation, you know, but, you know, the other day he referred to uh, Ron DeSantis as Ron DeSantimonious. And, you know, it just seemed like not a good time to attack a man like Ron DeSantis, who has kind of led Florida through uh, a couple of hurricanes recently. You're in Florida. You're there. Um you know, so I, you know, I, like I said, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but uh, that's a shining example of rhetoric that is definitely very, very negative. Do you have a favorite poet? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, in America, Wallace Stevens. In Europe, Seamus Heaney. Um, and these are poets that I've been reading for a very long time. Um, and will go on reading. I am I'm fond of Robert Frost's poetry, um, and I am very fond of Emily Dickinson, uh, though I do not try to imitate her. I think people make a great mistake when they do that. Um, but in America, the poet who achieves, in my opinion, the, the best synthesis of the intellectual and the sensuous as Wallace Stevens. And in Europe, um, in my experience of English, at least, it is Seamus Heaney, uh, who has a vocabulary. It, it beggars description how many words he has at his disposal, accurate and precise words to tell you something. It's mm -hmm. it's a wonder. Uh, it fills me with, with joy to, to read him do it. Um, I remember just briefly uh, mm -hmm. coming across a, um, a review which mentioned a, uh, an Irish farmer um, who was fond of reading Seamus Heaney because he can tell me what the plow does when I put it in the earth. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just mm -hmm. astounding. That is astounding. Yes. That is astounding. Yeah. And, and he, and, he and Stevens are at the top of my list. I can see why. Do you have a favorite poem that you've written? Uh, the poem that uh, means the most to me uh, is uh, a, an attempt to um, talk about my daughter. Um, and it's the last poem in the book. Um, and it's entitled, Our Hands Are Also Wings. And it's about the same length as the other one. Poets often write about their daughters. Hmm. I've done so myself, since I think of mine as a wonder I still scarcely believe. Mm. Numbers at her birth were all ones and threes, 1113, 1133, and for 30 minutes she didn't cry. After the cut, the midwife rotated her head, so she emerged face up, looking straight at me, her eyes seeking light like an eagle's aloft. Today, she paints birds of all kinds. You should see the shapes and colors her hands illumine in beaks and wings and feathers foiling the sun. I sometimes think they must descend for her and bank their bodies for her to brush and sweep the spirit of soaring from the air onto canvas. In my study, as I write, 
Her images awaken my inner vision and focus imagination on the ever pure contingency of nature's regularities, the power of accident to liberate beauty's human machines can only copy. I work in awe of probabilities that create not by command, but by chance, providing our arts their chances to live. As life on earth has itself evolved to fashion abundance, we, however, regularly kill, killing ourselves as we poison our house. In our affairs with fear, always fatal, which deprive us of our one true worship, the praise of our hands, as in my daughter's wings. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's funny, um, you went into reading that and I didn't even realize you were reading. So it begs the question, do you speak like you write or write like you speak? And that, I guess, is a very, very high praise because... Uh, Thank you. Yeah, because we were talking about your favorite poem, and then all of a sudden I realized you were reading the poem and because it, 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 it didn't seem stilted at all. It all seemed like good, natural language. You're an articulate person to begin with. So uh, it's just a beautiful poem. I'm sure your daughter treasures that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. She and I talk a lot about what I write. And I talk with her about what she paints. Uh, she's a very good portraitist, but she also does murals, mm. gigantic murals for uh, local organizations that want a wall painted. And she does birds, as I re refer in the poem. She can paint the most amazing images of birds, not just abstract, but the actual bird, which she has studied from photographs, and then turns into uh, this glorious palette of colors that she can choose. I, I feel very proud of her, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, well, undoubtedly so. I mean, uh, her work sounds tremendous, just like your work sounds tremendous. And I was going to ask you about, you know, raising a daughter, with a love of the arts. Do you think, obviously you were an influence, you have a love for the written word, you have a love for the spoken word. And I'd imagine that extends to other art forms as well, but how did she begin painting and how did you help foster that? And tell me a little bit about that. About that. I'm very fortunate in, in not only in, in my uh, children, Brian and Elaine, but also in my spouse, Judy. Um, Judy has a, a, a remarkable talent uh, in drawing, not so much painting. She's very done very little painting, but she does draw. Mm. And Elaine seems to have inherited this uh, already by the time she was um, 10 years old. Yes, 10 years old. Uh, she was um, painting scenes uh, that would just take our breath away. Um, and so all we had to do was buy our paints and, <laughs> and canvas. Um, she's grown in maturity from that start. And um, we have, we've been fortunate uh, to be able to encourage her. Uh, and the, um, the result is a, um, a personality that understands perfectly well how difficult life is and, and what a, a trial getting along in the world is, but who at the same time has a, if I dare say, a gift that gives her solace and meaningfulness. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. Wonderful. Wonderful. Wanted to ask you, um, your reading is beautiful. Uh, you, I say that as an actor. I don't know if I could do better. Do you uh, think about recording some of your poems or have you done that uh, or putting this into an audible type book? Uh, 
I have recorded many of my poems and I have given public readings, um, but I have shied away from trying to, uh, how would I put it, uh, professionalize recording because above all, sir, I don't have the equipment. Right. Uh, and I know from my experiences on campus before I retired that uh, good recording, such as you're doing with your organization, requires equipment. Hmm. Uh, and it moreover requires people who have competency hmm. uh, and the time to, to do things uh, in the best possible way. So I have sort of held back. Um, obviously, I can record into my computer, and I often test a poem mm -hmm. by doing that. But I haven't tried to professionalize and market recording, no. Well, something to think about. I bet you yes. it's a good conversation you could have with your daughter, because in this digital age, you can get a couple of accessories for your iPhone and uh, have a pretty good recording. You were a professor of English literature there in Florida, I believe, up until just a couple of years ago? Yes. I retired in uh, 2016. I worked uh, 30 years at UF uh, and was responsible uh, for what we loosely call pre-modern literature. Sometimes I would teach Chaucer, sometimes Shakespeare, sometimes Milton. Um, I um, developed courses because I uh, I had uh, rank, finally. I, I always received one course a year that I could develop on my own, which is a great, great benefit. Uh, I taught lower division courses and required courses. Uh, that's my job. But I, I had one course that I could um, develop on my own. And the course in the last years that I was teaching that, um, well, there were two, actually. I taught a course in Shakespeare called The Ten Tragedies. There are ten, and you can fit them in a uh, regular term without violating their, their length. Uh, and I taught a course entitled Dante for English majors. Uh, where I tried to help students with an English translation of the comedy read the sorts of things that inspired modern English poets like Eliot or Auden or Seamus Heaney or any number of others going all the way back uh, indeed to Milton and Chaucer. Um, those two courses usually had good attendance interesting students and they were for me a chance to um, explore different ways of talking about poetry so that I could help students get over the uh, the fear they often have that poetry is from an alien world <laughs> uh, and can't really be understood. I could use what talents I have to try to quell that anxiety and help them read these uh, poets. Um, the great problem, uh, of course, is that uh, I was not teaching Dante in Italian, nor was I uh, teaching Shakespeare on the stage. Um, I was teaching in translation, and I was teaching the text of Shakespeare. And there's, there's room, of course, for both the text of Shakespeare and the staging of Shakespeare. But um, they are so huge in Shakespeare studies that to do both of them in one course, is just unless you do just one play and, and spend two weeks on the play and 10 weeks on how many times it's been staged, uh, which, and you'll never get them all. Uh, especially now that uh, television also matters. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel that that the courses were not as successful as they could have been, but I think they were still worth offering. I'm sure you were touching students that you didn't even realize um, 
you know, you have 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds in a required uh, literature class studying Chaucer or Milton or Beowulf or whatever it is like we have to study the Canterbury Tales. And I remember being, you know, a freshman trying to wonder what the heck these uh, Canterbury Tales were all about. But uh, some of it seeps in, seeps in, even if it's through osmosis to some of the students who seem a little dense at the time. Sometimes they, they do OK down the road. And brings me to the question, is poetry alive and well in 2022? Oh, I think so. Um, now, remember, uh, I probably should have said this earlier on. I do not have an MFA. Mm -hmm. I never graduated from a creative writing program. Uh, my degrees are the traditional MA and PhD. Mm -hmm. um, but here at Florida, it's a very powerful MFA program. has produced many fine writers. And there are very successful MFA programs all over America, in Canada, uh, in uh, Great Britain. Um, and there are, just because the computer has made it possible, many, many uh, venues for publishing new poetry. Hmm. Uh, the, um, the amount of new poetry that you can find if you spend an afternoon searching reputable sites is staggering. Hmm. And uh, I find in my own uh, uh, searches that m much of it is uh, worth my time. So I think poetry is alive and well, and I'm very glad for that. Very glad. Some of the emerging voices that you see on the scene these days? Um, uh, his name just flew right out of my mind. There's a young man, uh, Michael Palmer, Mm -hmm. in Jacksonville, uh, who's a very good writer uh, and also a musician who is able to fold uh, poetry writing and uh, his music together in interesting ways. Um, C. Dale Young is a graduate of the MFA program here at uh, Florida maybe 10 years ago who is publishing regularly uh, very good chat books uh, and also in the best journals. Um, and uh, what's her name? Uh, a young woman uh, named Ashley Kaiser, who finished, uh, I guess, seven or eight years ago, uh, remarkable poet, um, able to um, simply dazzle with the, her vocabulary and her, her freedom of choice of things to write about. Some we of talked that. a little bit, final question, um, about your daughter and how you helped, you know, her form, her love for, uh, you know, visual arts and painting. Who instilled the love of the written word and the spoken word in you? Because it didn't seem like a traditional route uh, when you were talking about your upbringing. Um, you know, no. you didn't grow up in the Northeast uh, under the tutelage of parents who'd gone to Yale or something. Uh, no, I, no, I certainly didn't. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, how you got to love all of this. I, um, I went to... Um, a small high school in Western North Carolina uh, in the 60s. And for um, four years in a row, I had uh, remarkable English teachers, uh, all women, uh, who frequently read aloud, uh, which is important. And were very good readers uh, of poetry aloud. And uh, the woman who taught me my senior year uh, was, 
I, I'll tell you a really brief story. Uh, she was born in 1908. Hmm. And in 1940, uh, she was 32. She earned at the University of North Carolina a MA in medieval and Renaissance poetry. A woman at this time in North Carolina. <laughs> Unheard of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and she she was she was wonderful. I also had a Latin teacher. Mm. Uh I was very fortunate in my Latin teacher who exactly. gave me a lot. I don't Which is why you said in the beginning of this interview that uh certain languages are not dead at all. They're certainly not dead to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has been a true pleasure speaking with you today, Al. You. I have a lot of writers on this show. And I got to tell you, you are at the top of the list. I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned thank a you. lot from it. Um, and I hope our viewers enjoyed as well. But thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, sir, very much. I am very grateful. Have a good My, day. You too. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight. <laughs>